question. And yeah, thank you, Michelle, for your great talk. Again, um, we can pick up any more discussions at, at the discussion session um, in about 20 minutes. Um, for now, let's hand over to Amy Jimmer and Chris Jarvis from the London School for Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and they'll be talking about the COMIX study, um, a social contact survey in the UK. Hello, Amy. Okay, Hello. hopefully you can see my screen. Okay, yeah? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Excellent. Hi, so I'm Christopher Jarvis. I'm an assistant professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, so I'm going to be presenting on the COMIX study today. And I've got names of a couple of colleagues that have worked on the project over the past 18 months. Um, so fortunately, I've already had a sort of nice bit of background, so I don't have to explain what a contact survey is or stuff like that. So I'll jump straight past that and get on to COMIX. So in March last year, uh, John Edmonds, who's already been mentioned as sort of doing some of the real early contact surveys, uh, put in a grant to do a contact survey during the pandemic. So we initially uh, started uh, planning it in early March. So it was myself and Kevin Van Zanfort that started creating the surveys. I think it was sort of 7th or 8th of March. And the idea was to collect information on social contacts, demographics, uh, behaviours, and attitudes, stuff such as do you agree with government interventions and different things like that, and to look at the impact of different interventions that would come into place. And really, we wanted to understand the mixing patterns that were going to happen during the pandemic and try and inform sort of uh, the different public health agencies that we would have uh, about what might be needed. And the original plan was for us to recruit 1,500 adults in the UK, Belgium and Netherlands, and we were going to collect data every two weeks for eight rounds. So it was just going to be a 16 week study. And the idea was to be representative of the population. Um, and then what actually happened was, I guess it was COVID. So people were throwing lots of money around and we got requested to increase the sample size in the UK to two and a half thousand adults. We also realized we we're really going to need information on children. So we started asking parents about their children. And we, we're doing it every single week in the UK. And at the moment, the study is going to go on until February 2022. Um, so it's going to be about 100 weeks in total, and we're 83 weeks in. And then data was collected sort of every two weeks for Belgium, Netherlands, and Norway was added on. But it then ended up getting expanded even bigger. So it going to an extra 17 European countries at the uh, sort of end of last year. So we've ended up collecting a huge amount of information um, weekly in the UK and at sort of different parts of uh, the pandemic across different countries in Europe. So in terms of results that have come out of it, there's been a lot of publications, a lot of weekly reports, somewhere in the region of sort of 80 on this. And I'm just going to sort of show this as an overview to show that there's been a lot. And also, there's also been quite a few from Belgium and other countries being involved. And then I'm going to drill down in a couple of them uh, that I've been more involved in and I can speak about with a bit more detail. So one of the first analyses that we did was something that was, was planned, and this was very early on. So the first day that we collected data was the 24th of March, um, which meant that we got information for contacts on the 23rd of March, which happened to be the very first day of lockdown. Um, we received this date, our first round of data uh, about two days after that, I think on a Wednesday evening, and we spent the entire evening cleaning everything and processing it. And about 5 a.m., I got a text message from John saying, do you think you can calculate R naught? And about a few hours later, I came out with an estimate of R about 0 0.6. So what we did was we compared the contact matrices of COMIX, which we'd measured, uh, to that of Polymod, the one that's been mentioned before. And from that, we were able to get an idea of how much of a reduction in contacts uh, we had seen. And it was about sort of a 70% reduction. And although it seems kind of obvious now, this really was one of the earliest indications that the lockdown was actually, had, had been sufficient enough to actually start reducing cases and stop the ongoing epi epidemic in the UK. 
this got picked up by a bunch of journalists and reporters and was reported like pretty reasonably well. And it was a really, really early estimate. And then I remember about a month or two later, uh, people using sort of data on cases and hospitalizations and coming out and getting an R estimate of about 0.63. So this was one of the ways of sort of collecting this data really rapidly allowed us to estimate something that was really useful and given insight uh, just well before we would have been able to from other types of data. One of the other big analyses we did was one that we didn't anticipate and kind of couldn't really because we had no idea there were going to be all these local restrictions and we also didn't realize that we were going to be collecting data for anywhere near as long as we ended up doing. And for this one what I did was looked at contacts for individuals before a restriction came into place and then compared it for that individual uh, their contacts after a restriction had come into place so we could get paired analysis and remove the sort of between person variation um, so we was able to look at some of the restrictions such as there was a period of local restrictions the rule of six the 10 pm asking people to work from home and what we came out with was there was sort of very little suggestion that things like the rule of six and the 10 pm curfew had that much of an impact on contacts now this was picked up by the media as well um, and I would say the reporting was stronger than I would have liked or than what we presented in the paper. So they went for zero effect on reducing COVID spread. So there's a big difference between reducing your contacts and reducing COVID spread. Reducing contacts can help, but the type of contacts really matter for that sort of context. But I thought interestingly, interestingly from a communication point of view here was when this came out, it was used to fuel both sides of the argument. So there were people that would say, these uh, restrictions have zero effect, therefore we need more restrictions. And then there were equally other people using this as evidence to say, these restrictions don't have any effect, therefore we should get rid of them. And it was quite interesting to see your evidence being presented by people having opposing arguments and then realizing that they're just using your, your single analysis. One of the other main things that we've done are these weekly reports. And really it's this graph in the bottom left that's been the main feature. So it's calculating these mean contacts over time. So in the purple, we have adults. And in the yellow, it's adults and children combined. So really what we're seeing as we look over time where we see these differences are the periods where schools have been open over the last year. So if you look here, you can see in the third lockdown, the yellow and the purple, very, very similar. And then it diverges once schools were open. <coughs> and this kind of stuff has been replicated in much nicer graphs in the BBC and picked up talking about stuff uh, by David Spiegelholt or about it's not the rules and advice, it's the human behaviour that actually matters uh, to slow the pandemic. So clearly there's a lot of information that can come out of a survey like this and this amount of data. So I've tried to just pull out the sort of key points of uh, what I thought over the sort of last 18 months. First one, that there was a really large reduction in contacts. So it was about 70% lower than pre-pandemic levels in the first lockdown. It's currently at about half the level of Polymod or, or BBC, they were quite similar measures. But I think it's key to realize that there, our survey is a different methodology. And there's also a lot of survey fatigue. So we allow participants to be in the survey for about eight rounds. So that could be 16 weeks, but we've now got to the point where individuals are coming back into the survey after having a break of several months, because we're, we're pretty much exhausting the market research company that do the survey for us. The other main thing that was interesting to me was the lockdowns cause big changes, but it's not the same for applying a lockdown as it is for releasing. So one of the big assumptions that was done in the early pandemic modeling was if we apply a lockdown, contacts drop. We then lift the lockdown, contacts go back to the same level before. Whereas what we saw was quick decreases in contacts after they're opposed, imposed, so closing schools and working from home, but really, really slow increases after they're lifted. So after the first lockdown was lifted, we were expecting to see some sort of big jump, and week after week, the data would come in and we would say it's not really changed much. 
which was very surprising for us. And then one of the things which was quite a uh, quite a big moment when I realized it because we were able to apply the newer R noughts for the later variants to the contact matrices we had in the first lockdown is we realized it wouldn't have got R below one if it had been the newer one of the newer variants. And actually in January, it was natural immunity that was helping to get R below one when we applied the third lockdown because at that point, barely any vaccination had actually been done. Why not? So survey challenges. So for doing a survey like this, the contact patterns, they're pretty difficult to measure, in, in especially the ones where you've got people with a high number of contacts. So we ended up having a box where people could type in the number of contacts that they'd had if they weren't able to report them. Um, but this meant, similarly to the BBC one, you have people reporting hundreds or sometimes thousands of contacts. And when you then move down into sort of smaller groups, that can really affect the mean contact in a huge way. Um, one of the other things that's difficult is defining a contact and how really what is an effective contact changes over time. So early on, people weren't really wearing masks. They might have been meeting indoors. And then later on, people start meeting outside. They start wearing masks. They might take other precautions. So the mean contact starts to have a different relationship with transmission. Another difficulty was getting information on special populations. So we were consistently asked, asked, can you tell us about this subgroup or can you tell us about this specific subgroup? But really it's a massive challenge to get sample sizes uh, big enough to be able to say anything meaningful. It was also really difficult to keep track of the policy changes. So you keep wanting to adapt the survey, add in something else, take stuff out, and to make it comparable internationally is gonna be a real challenge to try and actually uh, get to grips with all the different policies that are in place. And in terms of doing the survey during the pandemic, it was just hugely demanding trying to adapt to survey in real time and cleaning analysis and interpretation simultaneously is, is just really, really difficult at the best of times. But then when you're in a situation where everything's getting lots of attention and work's getting picked up easily, it's a really, really difficult balance of trying to be useful over a long period of time and sustainable. So you could help a lot of people in one week and then you may not be able to clean the data for the subsequent three weeks and you can't provide sort of bare minimum. So it was a, a difficult balance of ignoring people and also just trying to focus and, and get on done what you needed to do. The other difficulty is there was lots of money, but there were few skilled people. So we consistently had funders saying, well, we can throw more money at you but actually the contact surveys, they're really complicated to do. And the market research company, I think it's, it's one of their most complex surveys. And when they send the data through to us, comes through as an SPSS file. And the way that data set is not really set up of how you would want to analyze a contact survey. So there's a huge, huge ordeal that we go through to try and get it in the right process. And that meant it was difficult to get people up to speed, particularly when we're already sort of working at our limits. And then the other thing is the sample changes over time. So you've got fatigue in capturing contacts, but you've got more related to the lockdown is this kind of survey becomes most interesting when restrictions get lifted. But when restrictions get lifted, wanting to sit at home and do a survey becomes far more boring than going to a pub or finally seeing all the people that you haven't been able to see. So there's a difficulty there with fatigue and actually capturing the people that might have the most amount of contacts. So looking forward, so the approach that we took with using a market research company, doing it as a, a retrospective, so we asked people to talk about yesterday rather than trying to say, right, we're going to record it over the next day, needs a bit more validation. We went for speed of data versus data quality. Then there's questions of whether or not it should be routine. And I mean that in terms of should it be a public health institution that collects data like this maybe every quarter or once a year? but also the frequency of which you would do a survey. We've done it every single week. I think that probably was too much. One, it was too demanding on our team, but two also probably would have been better to have done a better design survey and maybe done it after each intervention happens or as restrictions change. But again, that would might be difficult to achieve. Um, it's really hard to keep a survey like this simple. You keep wanting to add more stuff in and we still have things that we want to change now. 
And I would say if I was doing something like this, it requires either a large or a really dedicated team. So we had sort of two to three people at different times who were working lots of evenings and weekends to try and get around and do all of this, all of this stuff. And then in terms of work that we're looking at next, it's to delve into the international comparisons because we've now got a lot of data across a lot of different countries and we're able to answer some interesting questions on sort of different subgroups, such as uh, what, how, what were the contacts like for pregnant women during the pandemic and how did they differ and what were their attitudes and behaviours like? So a few acknowledgements of funders and uh, some of the partnerships that we've had. Um, but I'm going to stop there and say thank you very much. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you, Chris. Um, that was a great talk as well. Um, yeah, please, um, please do feel free to ask any questions now. I believe we'll just spill over into the discussion um, session anyway. So um, if we can get going with any quest questions directed at Chris. Um, um, but yeah, please do raise your hand or um, leave a comment in the chat. Okay, uh, Michelle, please do uh, go ahead. Hi, thanks, Chris. That was fascinating. Um, yeah, I'm trying to form my question properly. Um, I think if I got this right, you said that you saw contacts dropping quickly when a lockdown was instigated and rising slowly afterwards. Is that right? And we kind of see the opposite from the app data and more. Uh, yeah, so I'm trying to get my head around what the differences are. So I think. Um, the, the app data is something of a proxy for, for mobility, but it's very specifically the mobility of people who are currently testing positive. And so I think my question is, could you speculate on what might be different about the people who are currently testing positive and their contact rates versus the people coming through your survey? So we're gonna have individuals that are gonna have stayed at home and not seen anyone they'd be very unlikely to test positive. So I'd imagine they're not going to come into your database. So that's going to drop ours down. Um, then what, what we probably thought it was, was a sort of an adverseness to risk and people putting in precautions themselves. Yeah. Um, you Typically, you would think the people that are testing positive would be on the higher end of the contacts on our scale as well. Yes. Potentially also it's work based as well. I mean, the majority of the contacts is work based. I would imagine people who were at higher risk of getting COVID may have also been some of the people that were busiest in work during the pandemic and also less likely to respond to an online survey. Yes. And possibly more likely to have it mandated to maybe download an app for mm. contact tracing or something for their work. So I, I would think that those would be my sort of initial hypotheses of of how our groups would probably differ. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Michelle.